Let, let me put it to you this way. When do you see someone veiled nowadays? Marriage. Huh? Mar Marriage. Who is normally veiled? The bride. The bride is veiled. And when does the unveiling of the bride occur? At the end. At the end. When the bride and groom do what? Kiss. Kiss for the first time publicly. Right? Mm -hmm. Which is a prelude to what? The what? The consummation. The consummation, the wedding night, when the two become one. The honeymoon. Flesh. Mm -hmm. So when it says this is the unveiling of Jesus, it is as if we are covered with a veil, and it's now then revealed to see Jesus. What is this implying? It's implying a wedding between whom? The church and Jesus. The book opens with this imagery and it carries it all the way through the end. And we've already been here before about that. Because when we jump to Revelation 19, which is where at the end of the book, what do we read? Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. I know I keep eating this dead horse, but it's worth beating. Because if we don't get this idea that the book of Revelation is about the consummation of the ages, about the joining of God and his people again, in this, if you will, metaphor of marriage, then we've missed the whole point of the book. And then we get hooked into these Bible prophecy preachers wondering when we're going to be chipped and when the Antichrist is going to come and which of Trump's uh, advisors is the Antichrist and this, 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 and that. And we start planning dates and it's like, oh, it's going to be uh, the election of 2020. You, you get it? And you see, because you've missed the point, anything, all these crazy ideas begin to make sense. The purpose or the point of the revelation of Jesus is to reveal him to us. It's to lift the veil. It's to bring us into intimacy with him. That was the whole point of the message to the churches. After the first initial vision in, in chapter 1, chapters 2 and 3 are all about God, Jesus, speaking to local congregations at the time. And his number one message is what? Repent. Repent. Why? Because you're away from him. You're in sin. And so his first message to the churches is what? Repent. Repent. Come. Come back. Because it's all about this relationship that God has with his people. And if we miss that, we miss the point of the book. We get hung up on wondering what the woman in clothes with the sun is all about. You know, what does the dragon represent? What are the locusts that come out of the abyss? Are they demon-possessed helicopters? Right? And you see, that, 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 that you're missing the point. What's the point? The point is love relationship that God has with his people that he is consummating at the end. We are in the process of becoming holy. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. We are making our wedding garments now. What do you mean? The marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. To her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. What's that fine linen? 
deeds. Good, good deeds. deeds. Right. It's the righteous deeds of the saints. It's the holiness that we have put on. It is Christ that we have put on. And how do we do this? Let me give you a hint. Repenting. How? Through Repenting. The Holy Spirit. How? Through the, Holy Spirit. Through the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that makes us ready. That empowers us to live the life of love that Jesus called for us. To repent. To turn away from sin. And to turn to serve a living God. That's the essence of repentance. I've, I've done this before, but I know we have new people here. Paul gives an excellent understanding of repentance. Book of 1 Thessalonians 1. <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 1. <clears throat> Well, let's go to verse 6. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. There he is again. You can't get away from this. Repentance and, and joy and living the Christian life without the Holy Spirit. You just can't. That's why he was sent, so that we could do it. So that you become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acadia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you not only in Macedonia and Acadia, but in every place your faith in God has become known, so that we have no need to speak of it. Here it is. For the peoples of those regions report about us what kind of welcome we had among you. How you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. That's repentance. Did you catch that? Repentance, biblical repentance, is turning from your sin, your idols. Turning from that to God to serve him. Another word for serve would be obey. Amen? Amen? Okay. This is the essence of what Jesus said. Belief is. What do you mean belief? Gospel of John chapter 3. The one who comes from above is above all things. The one who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He's talking about himself. He testifies what he has seen and heard, yet no one accepts it. Whoever has accepted his testimony has certified this, that God is true. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. There he is again. The Father loves the Son and placed all things in his hands. Now watch this. He, whoever believes in the Son, what? Has, has eternal life. life. But whoever disobeys the Son will not see life, but must endure God's wrath. Did you see what Jesus did there? He equates belief with obedience. You cannot believe without obeying. You might as well say whoever obeys in the Son has eternal life. Whoever disobeys the Son does not see life. <coughs> belief and obedience are the same. You cannot just have a mental acquiescence to the faith and not have a change of heart in life. It's impossible. This is what James says. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. The marriage. 
conflict between Jesus and the church. Yes. Explain the church. You, who, what makes up the church? We do. Yes. The people are the church. Yes. So it's a marriage of Jesus with Us. believers. Yes. Which make up the church. Correct. Okay? Yes. That's exactly right. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or Greek. The book of Revelation makes that abundantly clear from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Both Jews and non-Jews are all God's people. All who believe and obey the Son have life. Simple as that. James says this, faith is not something that you just acknowledge. I believe this and yet live in a completely different manner. It transforms you. Faith and obedience are the same thing. You cannot have one without the other. It's impossible. Okay. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? What's the answer? No. You can't have that kind of faith where you just say something but don't follow up with it with words. It doesn't work that way. If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says, oh, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and do not supply their bodily needs, what is he talking about? You've got to take care of your neighbor. Corporal and spiritual works of mercy, yes. Corporal and spiritual works of mercy. But if you just say, oh, I'm not going to help and just move along, so faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. It is impotent. It will not save your soul. Got it? But if someone says, I have faith, and I, you have faith, and I have works, show me your faith apart from your works. And I, by my works, will show you my faith. Do you believe that God is one? That's nice. The demons believe that. What difference does it make in their lives? None. None. Even the demons believe, and they shudder. They do a little bit more than you do. They fear God. They don't obey Him, but they fear Him. Do you want to be shown, you senseless person, that faith apart from works is barren? And then he does this quote from Abraham, how he was justified by works. You see that faith was active along with his works, and his faith was brought to completion by works. Thus the scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him by righteousness. You see that a person is justified by works, and not by faith alone. Got it? Faith and obedience are the same thing. And this is something, again, that we've been seeing all through the book of Revelation. When the dead are judged, right? I saw a great white throne, and one who sat on it, earth and heaven fled away. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. And another book, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their deeds. Their obedience to the faith that they profess in the expression of corporal and spiritual works of mercy are what's going to save your soul at the judgment day. Merely professing Christ and a faith in him and have no change of heart in life means nothing. The demons have that. They have a better theology than you do. I guarantee you. The lowliest, wickedest demon can outmatch any of us in the theology of God. You know why? Because they not have faith, they have experience. They know God. We have faith, we've never seen God. 
they have. They know their faith. You don't. You know what I mean? That's why they shudder. They know they just don't do. They don't obey God, do they? No. That's why they're fallen. You see what I'm talking about? So their faith, their belief, their knowledge of God makes no difference in their existence. You need to, you certainly do need to know about God. There's that component. But by knowing him, you do, you obey. He who obeys the Son has life. He who disobeys the Son will not see life. Jesus equates belief and obedience together. It's very important because this is one of those issues that separates our brothers and sisters, our Protestant brothers and sisters, because they have the mistaken understanding that they think that Catholics are working their way into heaven. That you just, when you're a Catholic, you just work like a beaver. And, 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 and the most you're going to get is purgatory at the end. It's like that's, that's a misunderstanding, a, a, a warped understanding of Catholic theology about salvation. It really is. And it took, that was one of the, the biggest hurdles I had to overcome. And I went directly to the Council of Trent. And I wanted to read for myself what the Council said about faith and works. And I mean, I read some of those canons, they're really quite, you know, long, convoluted, complex sentences. I mean, I can only imagine what they're like in Latin. I was reading an English translation. And I mean, it's, there's nothing in there that says you have to work or earn your way to heaven. In fact, that's a heresy. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot earn heaven by yourself. Do you understand that? No. You know? Your works by themselves, apart from the love of God within you by the Holy Spirit, is useless. Works don't impress God. It's the love that you have that is shown in your works is what impresses God. And the love of what? Love of God and neighbor as expressed in the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. And the only way that you can really do those is in the power of the Holy Spirit. 